we are going to, at uh, popular request, record the plenary session. The plenary is where the uh, uh, presentations by each of our panelists will take place. And so once again, uh, here is MacArthur. Welcome back. Greetings, friends. It's such an honor to be with you. I, much like all of you, was abundantly blessed by Connie's message. I think it is, in fact, a prophetic word for this hour. Uh, and I'm, I've uh, just been moved to serve more. Uh, the first presenter today will be Jerry Coffey, who you've already been int introduced to. Um, there is a gentleman that I wanted you to hear from who came through ISS, IHS, and he has given me permission to disclose that he was houseless, uh, but now he is permanently housed, and his name is Penny. I saw him on the screen earlier, uh, but he stepped away. So when he comes back, I would like for him to take the time that I would have had to talk with you from a first person perspective. But uh, in what we're gonna do is just move Jim right into the panelists. And so Jerry, if you'll take it from here, that'd be great. Thank you, MacArthur. And thanks uh, to you, MacArthur, and everybody for uh, in my invitation to be here today. I'm always grateful for the Faith Summit. Um, and I'm glad that we're able to reconvene in this context, as opposed to not at all. Connie will ask me sometimes to be part of the Faith Summit. And uh, as a social worker, um, as I move in different circles in my life, both personally and professionally, I often encounter people who want to know what I do for a living. And I'm always grateful when I have the opportunity to tell people, uh, grateful and proud, actually, when I get the opportunity to tell people that I am a social worker. Um, one of the best things about aging, as you see my hair is turning gray, <laughs> is to become less concerned about small things and to feel the gratitude um, more and more to be open to understand and acknowledge blessings in my life. And one of the blessings in my life has been that I have the privilege of identifying as a social worker and I love it when I get the platform because it's an opportunity to educate people not only about what does a social worker do, but to have the conversation about social justice. It, it opens the door for me to tell people um, about the things that I do at IHS um, and what, the, what, what is really going on in the world um, because not everybody has the, the vision for that or the time um, or the intention to see what's happening in the real world. And when I get together with you folks, um, I'm reminded that there's actually a whole bunch of social workers running around on the planet. And it's very gratifying to know that there are faith and worship communities where social justice is underpinning the reason for your coming together in the various communities that you folks all do. So thank you for um, being social workers and having that spirit of social justice um, together with uh, your spiritual life and being uh, social workers uh, and spiritual practitioners all at the same time. What a great combo, yeah? Um, early in my career as a social worker, as many often do, I worked in domestic violence. And some of my earliest work was being in domestic violence shelters. And a mentor of mine at one time explained that a domestic violence shelter is like a hospital for the soul. Um, and that really resonated uh, with me and for me. And as I interacted with children and women in particular in those environments, uh, you did uh, typically see that their soul would return. Um, and it was uh, because of conscious community. It was because of being in a safe place um, and having people uh, stop and take the time to acknowledge and recognize their humanity, treat them as human beings, um, and to just see them for who they are. And there are a lot of parallels to that in the work that uh, Connie and MacArthur and, and myself uh, are doing at IHS. And I would say that a homeless shelter uh, is, like, is also very much uh, like a hospital for the soul. My training and my background as a social worker and as a clinical therapist, um, I've come to be more knowledgeable and more sophisticated about this thing that gets an awful lot of airtime uh, called PTSD. Um, it's very, um, very much the case that being a homeless individual, an unsheltered homeless person in particular, 
there is a lot of PTSD. And the title that I chose for my breakout, uh, Genius Minds, I had two agendas for choosing that title. I'll tell you the second one in a minute, but the first uh, agenda for, for thinking of a homeless person's mind as a genius mind, uh, it's to kind of underscore the miracle of this vessel uh, that God has given us that carries our spirit and our soul around. And the way that trauma uh, enters our bodies and the way that our bodies uh, on a chemical and a physiological level manifest trauma, um, to my way of thinking, and in the context of being a homeless person, it's an absolute miracle and a genius um, coping mechanism and coping strategy um, that if when we understand it and see it uh, as that, um, it makes a lot of sense in terms of understanding why homeless people do the things they do um, and why they say the things that they say. And so the goal for me today in my presentation um, hopefully is not to reiterate a lot of things that we all already understand and know about trauma, um, but to address it specifically uh, as homeless people experience it. Uh, some of the material is the kind of uh, training material and concepts that I use in the shelter every day when I train our staff um, who interact with this very difficult population and some very difficult and extenuating circumstances now in particular. Um, and the concept of a hospital for the soul also to me is appropriate because homeless shelters now more and more are actually hospitals. Uh, homeless folks are older, uh, they have a lot of chronic health conditions, um, and we see more and more medical vulnerability coming into all of our facilities, um, as well as on the street. Uh, so I wanted to perhaps address a little bit of that in the context of my breakout. Um, and back to the second reason for the name of my breakout. Um, if you chose to come to my breakout, then you must also be genius. Uh, so I look <laughs> forward, I look forward to um, being together with you folks in a bit. Um, that's a little bit of the underpinning of what I have planned to talk about today. Um, and really, this is the, kind of the takeaway would be to normalize trauma, normalize it as it happens in the lives uh, and spirit of homeless people, and to talk a little bit about how we work with that. So I appreciate, again, the opportunity to be uh, with kindred spirits uh, and all of you who have social work hearts. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jerry. At this time, we'll go to the Reverend Irene Hassan. Hi, MacArthur and everyone else. Thank you for inviting me uh, back to Hawaii. I have been all over the country this month. My, um, my current job title is I'm the Minister for Refugee and Migration Services for the UCC National Office, as Kyle highlighted. And um, I started that job at the beginning of August. And then the next week, uh, the largest refugee crisis that has ever happened um, in the history of in American history happened. So I have been uh, literally in almost every state in the country this month. So it's really nice to be back in Hawaii. And let me tell you what, you guys are like way more chill than, than a lot of the rest of the country. I know that's so shocking that Hawaii would be chill, but uh, this has been a really fun Zoom meeting so far. Um, so thanks again for, for having me here. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys about creating a chaplaincy. Um, it is totally possible. And what I mean by chaplaincy is a lot of what Connie was talking about, in which we, the church, have a unique ability to uh, enfold people in love, purpose, meaning, and tell them that their transformation is possible because God makes it possible. This is the center of what Jesus Christ gave us when he died and rose again. And this is the message that we can bring out to others. And that's um, been the center of my ministry for the past 10 years is uh, trying to highlight, um, reflect that mirror of beauty onto the souls of folks who are homeless, who are refugees who are displaced, who are vulnerable, um, because that is the kingdom of heaven, is giving people new life and new hope, and we have a mission to be present with those folks. Um, and so I wanted to give you tools about how to do that, because it is possible. So the first thing I want to do is show you the first two minutes of a video from my first pastoral call. I worked for, um, uh, and I'm sorry, Kyle, I wasn't able to give you my full bio. Like I said, I've been <laughs> in everywhere in the country this month. Um, so my first pastoral call was I worked for a homeless ministry in Boston called Common Cathedral. And um, the video will explain it some more, but I think what they're doing in Boston is something we could very easily replicate in connection with IHS and other homeless service providers 
here in Hawaii. So let me go ahead and play this video for you, or at least the first two minutes. It's a nine minute video. Um, I can show you the rest in the breakout room if you guys decide to come to that. Let me see. There we go. So here's my browser. Can everyone see it? Yes. Great. How do I move this thing up? There we go. So this, this news article that's pulled up is a, is a homeless ministry here in Cleveland that I can also talk to you about that's doing something similar to what I'm about to show you. Just to show you, UCC churches do it, and, and we can do it. Um, but here is Common Cathedral in Boston. I'm just going to show you the first two minutes. Enjoy. are the church outside with the people who live outside and some people say well why don't you try to move into a church building or why don't you get a building of your own and that's not it we're here in solidarity with people who can't or won't come inside. Ecclesia Ministries Common Cathedral was started by a priest named the Reverend Debbie Little. She really felt called to just go and be with poor people. She talks about a particular woman that she saw sitting on the steps with all her bags around her and just feeling this call to go and be with her and, and learn what that is to be poor. What she decided to do is to just walk around Boston Common with some peanut butter sandwiches and talk to people. When she would meet someone, she would say, you know, take me around and introduce me to the people that you know. She would say that the church was already here. She just gathered the people. She had met enough people and there was this community kind of emerging that they wanted to have a worship service. And so on Christmas Eve of 1995, she gathered some people in South Station, a big transportation hub, and they celebrated Eucharist on Christmas Eve. As Easter was rolling around in 1996, the people wanted to gather again. And this time they said, let's do it outside. Let's do it on Boston Common. People were talking about, well, since it's going to be on Boston Common, let's call it Common Cathedral. They gathered for Easter, they had a wonderful celebration, and I think Debbie thought that it was going to be another kind of one-time thing, but as the service was winding down that day, people said, see you next week. <laughs> so Common Cathedral has taken place right here in this spot every Sunday since Easter of 1996. We intentionally bring together folks who are housed and those who are homeless. Uh, to be transformed mutually together and to join in work serving the poor in our community by providing clothes and food and fellowship. So we are a church that meet people where they're at and we bring the church right where people are, out on the street, right across the street from the cathedral actually, in the Boston Common. And we have an altar on wheels and we make church happen without walls and windows and a roof. The whole idea of a town All right, so that's the little uh, sneak peek at uh, this amazing ministry that is still going on in Boston that would be um, doable in, in Hawaii. Um, so, you know, we can talk more story about how to do that in Hawaii, um, you know, in, in, in the breakout room. But basically, I mean, this is, this is a major thing that we could do together. And I do advertise that we do it together because as Jerry shared, uh, you know, folks who are, have experienced homelessness, they've learned different strategies in order to cope with surviving, in order to um, stay alive. And some of those strategies are very manipulative and difficult to work with. And I think we find as the church that we feel scared when we think about approaching a homeless person and saying, I love you. Because if we approach someone and we say, I love you, we're not exactly sure what they're going to say back because the way that their minds work are often so different than us because we've grown up with in a different way than they have and our, our brains haven't been wired to deal or to, to use manipulation strategies and so forth. So if we did it in covenant with each other and we were in constant conversation with each other, if we were in discernment with each other, prayer with each other, found a common theology and used our resources like Jerry and Connie and MacArthur to get best practices in there, um, you know, we would know as a team how to approach those situations in which we don't know what's going on in the mind of the other person and, and the best practice of how to approach it while also conserving ourselves. Um, so this is going to be my suggestion for all of us to come together um, and create a ministry like this to support MacArthur and what he's doing. And, you know, we could set up, well, I've just gone if we could do this, 
I can't do it. I'm in Cleveland, but I haven't asked Connie if, if you guys can do it. But you know, you can just set up right across the street from IHS with your with your little cart full of Eucharist and or you know make it an interfaith service so that it honors a plurality of vision. Anyway, there's just so many things you could do um, in order to bring a chaplaincy into IHS or around IHS or around homelessness in general. And the purpose of doing that. Um, to echo Connie and Jerry and MacArthur, is that when folks feel like they're loved, like they're part of a community, like they matter, like they have purpose, it totally changes everything else they can do. So, you know, when their case managers say, well, you need to go to the ID office and get your ID so that you can get your food stamps, you need to get your food stamps so that you can get into this apartment, you need to get into this apartment so that you can, um, find a job to afford that apartment, the job will not be that great. You're going to work at 7-Eleven for $10 an hour. Good luck. You know, that's, um, that's not, I mean, it's, it's exactly what they should be doing. We're grateful to IHS for doing that. But to have a community behind you that's saying, you can do it. We believe in you. We'll support you while you're doing it. And we'll come visit you and, and help you um, rebuild your life and hope and purpose. That will really help the folks at IHS get those things accomplished is to give these folks meaning or to walk with them while they find their meaning. Um, and it will also transform your churches, right? Um, in everything that we do in serving others, making sure that you understand the reason why you're doing it. I always, I always ask people to say, what's the takeaway for you? Because it is important to what the takeaway for you is. It can help with the vitality of your church. You know, I had started doing some of this work out at Kana Keakua when I was there before I got drafted out to Cleveland. Um, but, you know, when we started working with homeless services and started doing homeless service, we, we did a couple uh, services for the homeless out, out at Pokai Bay. And when we started doing that, young people started flocking in and wanted to be part of what we were doing because they saw that the, the church was being part of the world. So really, it can contribute to your vitality as well. And um, it'll open up for you a whole world of possibility. And you can do it. And we can do it together. Through God, anything is possible. That's all I got to say for here, but we can we can talk more later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Very much appreciate you. The uh, gentleman that I was going to have talk with you, unfortunately, had to leave for the morning, but he gave me permission to just share some basic information about you. But before I do that, I, I want to share with you the Serenity Prayer in its entirety. Uh, I have loved, I learned of it uh, many, many, many years ago, um, but I really came to study it while I was in the seminary, and it reads, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. As written by Reinhold Niebuhr. And you'll forgive the gendered language is, which is the language in which he wrote this, but we know that we serve a much more inclusive God that is beyond the realm of gender. But I wanted to speak to the courage to change the things we can. And I thought about that, and I think about that every single day when I do my job. What are the things that we can change? And I'm going to take that preposition and go from an I to a we. What can we change together? And that is the heart and the soul of this workshop today is to reimagine what we can change together. There are some things that we can do independent of one another and those are spectacular. Individual counseling, individual pastoral counseling. But the things we do together are even beyond that. There's a person that comes to mind and that's the one that I was gonna have speak with you and his name is Penny. And Penny is a man who is wheelchair bound and an amputee. And I met him in the homeless shelter uh, where I work every single day. I watched Penny work with other men that were incontinent of their bowels and their urine. 
and Penny wheels his wheelchair up to their bed, helps them get into the shower, helps to bathe them, and while they're drying themselves off, Penny will come back to their bed, strip their bed, do their laundry, remake their bed, and escort men back to their bed. It would be something if Penny did this for one person. My heart would still be breaking for the compassion that he embodies. But Penny did this for many men every single day. And when I would approach Penny and say, what do you need? What do you want? He'd go, no, no, no. Penny, what can I offer you? What can I do for you? No, no, no. There is a humility that I saw in Penny that I believe that we as a church are called to embody. Why the Joshua passage? Be strong and be courageous. And I wonder what it means to be strong at times. And what I saw Penny do is Penny to embody a different kind of strength, a different kind of courage. The courage not to be limited by his wheelchair, the courage not to be limited by his social location, the courage not to be limited by his physical ability, but to use all that he had as a facility to bring about health and wellness to others around him and to do it consistently. He lived this out in front of me. And whenever I think of Penny, I move to tears because I think this is the heart of Jesus. Penny never said the word God or Jesus to me, but I see God in Penny. I see the heart of ministry in Penny. I see the heart of Jesus and Penny inviting us, calling us to do more. What are the things that we can change? I offer you that question for your own context. What are the things that we can change to be of service to God's people? What are the things that we can change to be of those that are houseless, who erect tents on our sidewalk? who assemble their tents, as Connie said, in village, because they say to the world, even though we are homeless, yet because we are homeless, we've not forsaken our need for each other. What are the things that we can change as it relates to the women, the men, the children, the adolescents, the kampuna that house the homeless on our streets? There's work to be done, church. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity and your prophetic witness to even allow us to embrace this topic. But I wanna delve into that question. What are the things that we can change? Grant us the courage to see what we can change. I believe the work that is before us will transform us. You cannot do this work without being touched in your soul. I used to think spiritual renewal was going to Mexico for a week or going to the Bahamas for a week <laughs> and sipping on certain drinks and relaxing, laying under the sun and there's nothing wrong with those things. And I'm planning a little getaway to West Africa next year just to do those things but I'm also willing to see that renewal can happen in the shelter. Renewal can happen on a sidewalk. Renewal can happen in the space where the so-called least amongst us are gathered. And if we have the courage to step into those spaces, we will see God not only transform them, but perhaps the greater truth is that we will be transformed. Each day before I go into the shelter, I offer a simple prayer. God, help me to see those as you see them. Help me to serve those as you serve them. And help me to love those as you love them. And I'm transformed. 
sometimes I'm just transfixed. <laughs> it's like, how do we get all this accomplished? <laughs> but most days I come away feeling like it was another day to be of service and I could lay my head down tonight in peace. If you're seeking spiritual renewal, if you're seeking transformation, I wanna invite you to join me in this work that we might change the things that we can through God's given courage. Thank you. At this time, I would like to call upon my dear friend, Ellen Carson, who will offer us uh, her presentation. Thank you, MacArthur, for that moving story about Kenny and for your great spirit. I, I thank each of you on our Zoom today from the bottom of my heart for the missions that you're doing for UCC and for your ministry to our neighbors who are homeless. So thank you. I'd like to explore some new ways uh, to transform our ministries for homeless persons. We all want our ministries to be successful and transformative, but how should we measure success? Should we count how many meals and supplies we give away and assume that we're being more successful the more we give away? But the amount we give away doesn't say anything about whether we're being successful in an effort to end homelessness, does it? If we really wanna be effective at addressing homelessness, shouldn't we be measuring our success in large part by how many homeless people we help move into homes and find jobs so they can be productive and independent? And so there'll be fewer people who need to be fed and clothed each day. Isn't that the kindest and most loving thing we can do for those living on our streets? If you agree, what's the best way to help accomplish that goal? I wanna share three strategies I think can be helpful. Uh, the first is to do justice as well as charity. The second is to focus our homeless ministry on empowering independence and self-sufficiency. And the third is to team up with a comprehensive services provider like IHS to be part of a holistic approach that empowers independence. So first, let's talk about doing justice. I think we all love the prophet Micah's statement that what does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. The Bible mentions justice many times, and it means in this sense to put people into a right relationship with our neighbors, our community, and our God. So what does justice mean in the context of homelessness? Well, people become homeless for many reasons, uh, often due to trauma, social and wealth inequities, lack of affordable housing, lack of treatment facilities. And many of these problems arise from legal systems that are unjust and that need to be fixed. If we only offer charity to the victims of an unjust system, without also fixing the unjust systems that cause them to be homeless in the first place, then we'll just have more and more victims and we'll be enabling future generations of pain and suffering from those unjust systems that would fail to change. So let me give a few examples. You must be familiar with them because we have a median housing price here in Honolulu that is now over $1 million. As you know, we have a severe shortage of homes for our local residents. Did you know though that the US Census has just reported that we have one of the highest housing vacancy rates in the nation with over 85,000 housing units standing vacant. They're being used as vacation homes for speculation or they're just left empty. So we're pursuing an empty homes tax to help incentivize owners to convert empty housing to real homes for Hawaii residents. Another issue, we have many healthcare resources here but there's never enough treatment programs for those with mental illness and substance abuse. Generally, people cannot even voluntarily detox when they're ready to detox. We can seek more funding for affordable housing and treatment programs to help meet those dire needs. These are unjust systems that hurt all of us and they're downright deadly for our homeless neighbors. How do we do justice in those situations? We do justice through legislative reform and advocacy, calls and emails to our legislators, urging reform. Legislative advocacy is our way to participate in and change our legal system to make it more just. Doesn't our faith call us to speak out and speak truth to power, to right the institutional wrongs that cause pain and homelessness? So how specifically could your church do justice? 
If your church isn't already a member of Faith Action, I invite you to join Faith Action and support their legislative agenda for housing, affordable housing, empty homes tax, Hawaiian homelands, and other essential measures to help create a better community. They'll train you and make it easy to participate. Create a group of church members that are able to submit testimony and write letters to the editor to help urge changes needed to address homelessness and influence our public opinion toward that end. So consider expanding your homeless ministry to both do charity, but also do justice so we can help stop the injustices that are causing homelessness. So that was the first issue, do justice. The second is to help empower independence amongst those who are homeless. Remember the old adage that if you give a man a fish and you feed, you feed him for a day, but if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Are you incorporating that approach into your homeless ministry? Terry Ogawa, a church member who was a former IHS chaplain, asked our church one day, what is our homeless ministry enabling people to do? Are we enabling them to become self-sufficient? Or are we enabling them to continue living in danger on the streets? Wow, I never thought of it that way. It was a total epiphany for me. What are we doing when we provide our homeless ministries? Are we enabling people to become self-sufficient? Or are we enabling them to continue living where they are in danger on our streets? Did you know that here on Oahu, we have over a hundred deaths each year of people who live on our streets. Their average age at time of death is 54. They lose over 25 years of expected lifespan when they live on the streets. Our streets can be very dangerous places for people to try to live, especially when they suffer as they often do from trauma and illness. Enabling people to continue living on the streets may disempower them and doom them to lives of dependence and early death. I had two books I wanted to commend to you if you haven't heard of them yet. Uh, one is Toxic Charity, How Churches Hurt Those They Help and How to Reverse It. And the other is called Charity Detox. What, whoops, let me get it there. What charity would look like if we cared about the results. What charity would look like if we cared about the results. That's the type of focus I really enjoy because it helps refocus us on being transformative toward being effective in the ministries that we seek. Both of those books are by Robert Lupton and they'll be mentioned in my breakout room in more detail. So what can we do to avoid being a toxic charity? Foremost, we can empower people by identifying and helping them build their, their strengths instead of focusing on their weaknesses work together with those who are homeless to pursue their dreams, build their skills, build their resilience and help build community networks with them for support and inspiration. One example I wanna lift up is called Touch Heart. Pearl City Community Church, Central Union Church and Kalihi Union Church have all been home to sharing their kitchens to help the social enterprise organization help train homeless persons who have dreams of being caterers, chefs, food manufacturers, and things of that nature. Over 90% of the homeless persons who have been in this program have gotten jobs in the food service industry. Another example, you can Google it, is Hui Aloha. They're teaming with homeless residents in Kakako, Waimanalo, and Wainai, building relationships that can help breed resiliency and hope. And you can assist with a hand up instead of just a handout, providing job training, employment assistance, housing, educational opportunities, tutoring, the list is really endless. So I'd urge you to seek to realign and transform your homeless ministry if you're not already doing these types of things, to measure your success by the number of jobs created and housing placements found and people who have become uh, independent, self-sufficient and people who can be lifted out of poverty. And third and finally, uh, team up with a comprehensive services provider like IHS. One of the easiest and best ways to help assure our homeless ministries enable independence is to team up with a provider such as IHS that is providing the comprehensive range of services that are truly needed to help raise people to a higher level of self-sufficiency. They can provide the case management, mental health services, job training, housing placements, 
and other services that you may not be able to offer. So your ministry becomes a component in this holistic system to end homelessness. Over the recent years, IHS has placed over 10,000 homeless clients into housing, not shelters, but housing, provided employment services to over 4,000 clients, and provided life coaching to 5,000 clients. These successes are the result of hundreds of volunteers and staff who have devoted themselves to finding new homes and jobs and medical treatments for those in need and helping build their self-sufficiency. How could your church be part of this holistic approach? That's what I'll be working with in the breakout room that I'll be doing. Uh, you can help IHS with its housing efforts, adopt a family who's being rehoused, help paint and renovate a home, help fill out applications for those in need of jobs and housing, if, or even help teach food prep and business planning for an exciting new food truck project uh, that IHS is doing. There's many opportunities and Jill Right is the person at IHS that you can ask for for help. So last but not least, um, please do help provide ongoing financial support for providers such as IHS. They are the lifelines to so many. And after this um, meeting today, look for an email from the conference that should include a detailed list of ways that your church can help IHS and others to build independence and success and that will provide some of these resources for you. Thank you again for all that you do. Thank you so much, Ellen. At this time, we'll hear from Connie Mitchell. Thanks. Thanks, MacArthur. Um, I'm just thrilled, you know, to hear from Ellen and Jerry and everyone, you know, about um, you know, just some of the, the ideas, you know, that people are having and kind of bubbling up. And um, for me, I'm going to be really talking about this call that we have as God's people to love people, to offer grace, and to believe in the person's ability to change. But it's a really complex kind of um, process that everyone has. And in fact, our mission statement is such that we talk about providing um, a tailored solution for each person because we know that one, um, one solution doesn't work for everybody. I think I'm particularly wanting to talk to um, you know, anyone who's interested in this group about how um, those uh, life events or those, those things that some people get mired in that lead them into homelessness or contribute to them staying in homelessness. And I'm talking about um, substance abuse or mental illness, or, you know, like maybe it's chronic pain. You know, people um, end up using opioids because they're in chronic pain a lot of the time. But, you know, sometimes when people, um, their lives are touched by these things, they're not easy people to love. And sometimes they take advantage of us. Sometimes, you know, we just don't know whether anything's going to ever change. You know, we doubt, you know, sometimes whether there is a possibility of change. And so I'd like to um, really address that with um, those who are interested, because I also know that um, there are many people that are in churches right now who have family members that are struggling with this too. And maybe you're kind of thinking, okay, I'm ready to give up already because I've tried this, I've tried that, and you know, you're really not sure what to do. And so in my session, I really want to talk about um, that process of change, what it entails, you know, for the person, but also sometimes, you know, how they got there. Like, you know, how does it evolve into a situation where it's so difficult for them to get out of that particular situation? So, um, you know, I, I think that that's also one that, um, you know, it, it kind of is a, um, a complement to this other piece, which is not about, you know, these um, physical things that people get addicted to or they're um, impacted by, but there are also people who are coming out of jail and prison and they also um, are in a recovery of sorts as well, because they've lost a lot when you go to prison. You know, you, you lose, you know, your reputation, you lose your pride, you, you lose confidence, you know, that maybe you can come back and actually rebuild life. And so likewise, you know, I think there's um, definitely opportunities for churches, and churches traditionally have been, you know, a great source of help for folks you know, who have been incarcerated. But I just wanted to let you know that um, IHS is, con um, is really on a path to expand that service uh, within our um, spectrum of services. We currently have 
um, two houses that serve men and one house that serves women. Um, the women's house is in Kailua called Beacon of Hope, and they take people, uh, women who are on parole, and um, you know the other two are more uh, people who have, who are mostly done with their incarceration and they're in the uh, mode of really rebuilding their lives. And so um, those two houses are called um, house, houses of redemption. And it really offers people a very dignified place to live. And um, you know, a lot of people who come out of prison, if, you're, if they put you in a clean and sober house, many of the houses are very crowded. You may be um, you know, sharing a bedroom with you know, two or three people even sometimes, you know, like two bunk beds or something. In our houses, we, we try to keep it to two people you know, at the most you know, that are sharing a room. But it really gives people a sense of dignity and a, a space that is their own. You know, and we really want to you know, just kind of help people know that we believe in them you know, in that way and you know, to return them to a place where they believe in themselves. So, you know, I just want to, um, you know, let you know that that's what I'll be talking about. I didn't think that um, I was going to do the presentation right here, but I just really wanted to let people know um, just the gist of what we will be discussing in our breakout session. Thanks. Thank you so much, Connie. And our last presenter for this morning will be the Reverend Brandon Duran. Thank you, Chaplain MacArthur. Uh, this has been a wonderful and a humbling experience. It is. Um, it's an honor to be able to gather with each of you for this Mukupuni. And as I hear all the other presenters sharing and, and the depth of wisdom and experience that they share, it, it is humbling, especially when I consider and I look at the little participant list and see all the names and understand the different stories and uh, experiences and wisdom that's contained there as well. For my area, or what I was asked to speak about was around uh, theological background, the underpinning, some of the biblical rationale for why we engage in such a vital and transformative ministry. And I guess when I approach that question, I, I approach it with an assumption. And that assumption is that many of you here uh, have um, spent a lot of time in church, in church services, in, in ministries. And my guess is that uh, throughout your time in uh, being a part of the church, you've heard uh, theological rationales, biblical verses for why we engage in ministries such as this. My guess is that many of you, you might even have your own favorite verse for, for what uh, inspires you, what motivates you uh, to continue to be involved in caring for others. Like, like the verse uh, Ellen mentioned, the powerful one from Micah 6, 8. And there's so many that speak to engaging with those who are, with the, the, the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, and the ways that we can uh, join in serving and loving the broader community. And so when I come at this topic, I guess I wanted to come from, from two different areas because I'm sure that all of us could, could come up with a verse that talks about the, the impetus on us to share and to serve. Um, one is the, an experience I had years ago. And I had heard, prior to this experience, I had heard many messages um, that were similar to the messages I've heard shared today. But the experience that I had was one of those kind where, you know, it moved things from my head to my heart. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but, but it's something that I know I need in my life to help things go from the, the conceptual or the abstract to the, to the heart of the matter. I had been asked, uh, along with a couple others, to go to a, uh, a tent city in Seattle, Washington, and to be there uh, for a blessing of this tent city as it was just getting uh, set up and would be at, um, in the empty lot of a church for, for 90 days. And I got there and I was a little early. And uh, when I showed up, um, one of the residents of the tent city invited me to uh, come into a, a cantina they had set up. And, uh, and we were just chatting a little bit. And as, as we were chatting, he asked me if I if I was thirsty, if I wanted a cup of coffee, and, you know, I always want a cup of coffee. So I took him up on it and he brought out this cup. Um, and it's a, it's just a tin can that he had wrapped in a paper towel and then put a surgical glove around. And the, the paper towel and the surgical glove, you know, made it so that way the coffee wasn't burning my hand when I held it. Um, and it made it more comfortable to hold. And there was just something about this experience 
about being welcomed at his table, about being welcomed at that community's table, and about the creativity uh, that went into creating this cup that just instantly transformed that moment from um, I'm here with others to be a blessing or to bless this space to you have all welcomed me to your table and you have blessed me. And the light bulb of the amount of creativity and compassion that was that and courage that was already a part of that tent city and that was that was a part of so many uh, folks lives who live uh, outside or on the streets and and this this cup I've carried it with me for uh, well well over a decade many many years now uh, it's made several moves and it continues to occupy space on my shelf to remind me of how Christ finds us and welcomes us and invites us to Christ's table because that's that's what I saw in that moment. And that for me is one of the biblical motivations for being involved in this work. Is it's not just because there's commands that we should care for the vulnerable, which are wonderful and good commands, but it's also because that's where we can find Christ. And I don't know about you, but I want experiences with Christ. I, I wanna see the way that Christ is made present and real and tangible. Um, and I know that in my life or my experience, it's often in, in times of working uh, with those who, who may be outside or, or houseless, um, where Christ is made real um, in, in, in and through that community. And so for me, that's one of the biblical motivations that, that in, my, uh, in our breakout room we'll talk about. And the other for me, um, biblical motivation that kind of goes to that is the one that we, we probably do every week, I'm guessing, uh, in your churches when we say the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and I think it's already been referenced here a few times by some of our other wonderful panelists. And that line of uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that line, uh, that part of the prayer is, is pretty powerful for myself. Uh, because when I think about the kingdom of God, uh, what I think of is a place, what I think of is that there's a place for everyone. That all are welcome to the table. Uh, I think of the verse that when Christ talks about, um, I go to prepare a place for you. Because who would be left houseless, who would be left alone in the kingdom of God? Um, and if that is what we're praying each week, if that is what we're uh, offering up on our lips and in our hearts, uh, that, that prayer is a part of this work, as a part of this work of, of as Ellen was so beautifully uh, talking about creating uh, each little bit of that kingdom, of that vision of God around us and among us, um, which is through acts of charity, but also through acts of, of justice, of ways of creating uh, space and creating place for each and every one of us. So some of the biblical uh, theological ideas will be a part of the workshop, but also I, I really want to get to the how um, and how we put some of those, those ideas to practice. Uh, because I think there's some beautiful and creative and fun ways that, that you've already engaged in that I would love to learn from. And, and I might have a couple of ideas to share. Too. Um, so thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Excellent. Thank you so much to all the panelists. I so appreciate you. You know, the dilemma that I have whenever I go to a conference is I have to decide which workshop I want to go to or which breakout session. And I have to be honest, after listening to each speaker, I was like, oh my God, I want to go to theirs. I want to go to Irene's. I want to go to Connie's. I want to go to Ellen's. I want to go to Randall's. And so I think what I want you to know is that we're going to follow up and compile our presentations for you. We'll have recommendations for you and we'll have information for you uh, so that you will receive the benefit of all of our presentations. Uh, just MacArthur? as um, MacArthur. Yes. I hate to take anything out of order but I'm compelled to add a very brief anecdote to follow up on Brandon's Please experience do. with the coffee cup. Yes. It's very, it's very, it's related but different. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, 
Brandon, we have what are called medical respite houses uh, across Oahu. And these are homes where uh, homeless are discharged from the hospital into these houses until they repair and we can house them. And we have staff who go to the food bank twice a week and they collect food, whatever the food bank has for us that day. And they deposit the food around town to the various houses and to our shelters. And with the food bank, you never know what you're gonna get. One day I was working in my office at the Makiki Tutu Burt's house, which is upstairs. And the guests rarely come upstairs because most of them cannot do stairs. And one day I was working up in my office and there was a light tap at my door. And I got up from my desk and I opened the door and there was little Roxanne who had come all the way up those stairs to alert me that lunch was being served. And I very carefully took her by the arm and said, Roxanne, we gotta get you back down these stairs. And it turns out that what the food bank was giving that day was about as much Alaskan king crab as we could put in the back of a Jeep. And I sat at that table at Tutu Burt's house in Makiki with seven homeless people and they fed me Alaskan king crab until I couldn't eat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your story reminded me of that. And it was, a, it was a blessing. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, MacArthur. Awesome. No, awesome. And that sorry. Can I just add some one more thing? I wanted to add to what Brandon's um, cut reminded me of. Um, right now, there's a, actually an, an exhibit at the um, Honolulu um, Art Academy and the Museum of Art, I should say. And um, there is a exhibit there that is about homelessness. And, and I just encourage you guys, um, maybe, you know, if you have time to go take it in. Um, one of the uh, installations was done by one of our folks. Um, his name is John, and um, he basically recreate, um, recreated um, an encamp, you know, like a campsite, you know, that he um, that would be typical, maybe, of somebody you know who uh, was living on the street. I just want to tell you the story about John, though, because he is one of the people from Kaka'ako that came into one of our um, shelters, you know, at San Island. And he, over the last um, almost two years now, he started, you know, just volunteering every day, you know, cleaning our toilets, wanting to do, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, he uh, just continued to feel a part of the group. And he ended up, um, you know, slowly moving into like a different little, we have tiny houses there that, you know, are of different sorts. And so he ended up moving into one. And then he finally got to move into the, the one that was a two-story house, right? And um, he said, I have a little bit of an ocean view because it's at San Island, right? But he ended up doing that installation and he is now hired full-time at IHS you know, as one of our employees. But that, you know, for me, when I went to go look at his installation, it was seeing his journey, you know, and seeing where he had been and really fully appreciating the fact that this man, you know, has that, he has vision for creating things, you know, the way that he did. And I just, couldn't help wanting to share that, you know, after Brandon was sharing about his cup. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you so much. Sorry, MacArthur, I, uh, we're, we're all, we're, it's a coup. Let's go, um, let's go, let the spirit lead you. Well, I, I just want to echo that, that there, you know, all of us that have worked with vulnerable populations, there, there's a, there's a Brandon's cup story, um, because the, the ministry transforms you, but before, MacArthur, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention before I hand it back over to you, yeah. is that, um, one thing that I'm going to give MacArthur in terms of resources is if you guys do decide to engage in any of these projects, UCC National, which again is where I work now, um, has grants. Uh, so I'll, I'll drop you the links to the application. Those grants are meant to be empowerment projects um, to empower vulnerable populations. So I'll, I'll send you one for if you work with homeless populations in general, and then I'll send you the one that goes directly to me if you decide to work specifically with COPA migrants, since I'm the migration guy. Um, so thanks. Back to you, MacArthur, unless there's there's more winds in the spirit. No, but you know what? I, I, I think this is exactly what the spirit called for. I, uh, I believe that the surest way to make God laugh is to tell her your plans. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> with that said, are there other impressions? Are there other thoughts that surface for you? And I'm speaking to everyone right now. Reaction to the panelists. Panels were awesome. Thank you. Great, great. Just FYI, Ellen Carson and I are going to combine our uh, session together, and just wanted you to be aware of that. 
And at that, with that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Wayne. And I'm going to turn it back over to Laurie because she is the only one who can magically apparate us. This is what Jerry has been waiting for. We're going to apparate into our breakout rooms. Okay. I consider myself a word person. I had never heard apparate. So, you know, that just was lovely. It's, it's a Harry Potter term. 